Now, on your handout, we have pattern number four. And uh, so what I've done here is I've skipped Mounts' pattern three because pattern three is not a real pattern. What we're going to see is that the liquid futures that Mounts calls pattern three actually just follow the other three patterns that we're going through. So I'm going to get you through the third general pattern, which he calls pattern four. And in this kind of pattern, the root is going to be modified in a regular way to form the present stem. So you're going to be able to see that the present stem is derived from the present stem or from the root, but it won't be the root unmodified like pattern one was, and it won't be from a completely different root. It will be from the root, but just with some modifications. And they're uh, rather predictable modifications at that. Now, you're going to find this uh, on, um, let's see, this is uh, section 20.20 20 in mounts, and that's page 174, okay? So you can go there in your, your textbook if you want to sort of follow along here. <clears throat> now, I didn't, unfortunately, give us enough room to write down all these things here. So uh, you'll probably have to use the back of page three to, to get all of these. But let's, uh, let's take a look here and we'll, we'll follow Mounts's labeling here. So the first kind of regular pattern for modifying the root is uh, what he calls roots ending in a stop. Okay. So what are our stop consonants? Think of your square of stops. Yeah, so kappa, gamma, right? P and beta. And then we had those, those dental stops, tau and delta. Okay, so, so, so it, that this is what we're talking about. These, these are stop consonants. So, so look at what, uh, what Mounts talks about first of all. Uh, we have the idzo odzo verbs. Now, when he gives you idzo and odzo, this is what the present tense is going to look like at the end. Like baptizo is an idzo verb, okay? So, uh, what do we learn uh, about baptizo? Well, we're going to see that, that this is from a dental stem. I'm sorry, a dental root. The... The root ends with a dental. It's a dental root. Um, what is my root here? The root is for baptizo. It's bop tid. You see that delta here at the end? So that's a root whose final consonant is a delta, which is a dental, which is a stop. Okay? Bop tid. Bop tid. Now, uh, what is the present stem? The present stem is baptids, right? Now, the rest of that verb is baptizo, baptidzes, baptidze, okay? So, baptids is the, uh, the present stem. Can you see that the present stem baptids is related to the root baptid? Yeah. Yeah, there's some relationship here, isn't there? And, and, and what's, what's happened with this form? Basically, the root baptid has been modified. Um, I'll just mention this. Don't want to belabor it. But what happened was, uh, it seems that, uh, to this root, something called a consonantal iota was added. <clears throat> Think about, the, the word yes, you see the Y there? Is that a consonant or a vowel? That's a consonant. So Y can be a consonant, right? Now think about the, um, well here, the word by. He uh, went by my house. How is that Y functioning? Is that a consonant or a vowel? It's functioning as a vowel. 
Think about the word only. Is that why a consonant or a vowel? It's a vowel. Okay. So, um, in, as you know, in Greek, iota is a vowel, but there are some situations where uh, the iota functions as a consonant. It's called a consonantal iota. You don't see it in Greek. They don't write it in Greek, but it's affected the spelling of things. So when the consonantal iota was added to the delta, it produced a j sound, j, and that ends up creating a zeta. Okay, so the root has been modified ever so slightly, but modified nonetheless to form boptids. Okay, but you can see they are related to each other. Make sense? Okay. <clears throat> the other sort of, of uh, examples that he gives are verbs where the present tense ends with also. Also. Uh, wh what are these going to be derived from? They're derived from velar roots. Now remember where the velar area is in your mouth? Ka, 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 ka. Right over there by the little punching bag hanging down from the back of your throat. Uh, it's called the uvula. Okay? So, um, we're given the verb uh, tarasso as an example, and its real root is tarach. Do you see how the chi is a velar consonant? Okay. <clears throat> this becomes terrasso, terrasso, and so there's a modification of the root to form the stem here, terras. See that? All right. Now, let's go back and let's jot down the future forms of these two verbs. The future of bop Tidzo is bop tiso. Now, why do we have bop tiso here? What is really going on? Exactly. The future uses the real root for its future stem. The real future stem is bop tid. And then I add the sigma. And what's the delta going to do? It's going to drop out because dentals drop out before sigma. And that's why when all is said and done, it becomes baptiso. Okay. So the future stem is baptid. Exactly. In other words, the future stem is the, the root unmodified for the stem. But then when you add the extra junk on, then then that causes changes. But we're not changing the future stem from the root in the first place, okay? Uh, and then Tarasso's future is going to be Tarach plus a sigma, right? In other words, it's going to use the root, and then what's the chi sigma going to do? They become xi, right? So... That's the future of Tarasso. So I trouble and I will trouble. What an appropriate verb for this chapter. <laughs> <clears throat> the Greeks have troubled us. All right. So, so there, there you go. I can do B here. <clears throat> And uh, this is uh, what he calls the double consonants. Example. Let's take the verb balo. What is the real root of balo? Ball with one lambda. The present stem is ball with two lambdas, right? So, Can you see how ball with two lambdas is related to ball, the real root ball with one? Yeah. So this is a, 
a frequent kind of change that you'll see. Uh, and um, the, uh, it's certainly not coming from a, a completely different root, is it? So the present stem has been modified ever so slightly. So that's why this is pattern four. Roots regularly modified from the, I mean, stems regularly modified from the root. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's look at the, uh, the C section. And we'll get some, some new space here. I'll go, go to the end of the, the handout. So the fourth sort of uh, predictable uh, modification of the root to form the present stem is the, the, C, the C section. And here he calls this letters added. That is to say, you start with the root, and then there are some letters added to form the present stem. All right. So what examples could we uh, give here? Um, <clears throat> the root R has to do with taking up or, or taking away. The present stem is I rho. So do you see how the present stem, when you strip away the connecting vowels, personal endings, we're left with ir, ir. And you see how it seems to be related to the root, but there's been a modification of it. I've got an, an extra iota here. This is another situation where what probably happened was the consonantal iota was added, and it created this uh, sort of strange combination of sounds that was resolved by sticking the iota in here between the, the alpha and the rho. So ario becomes iro. Uh, let's just mention here that the future of iro, I will take up, is, uh, is ro, like this. So the future is derived from the root without any modification. It's the present that's a little bit irregular, right? It's been modified from the root slightly. So that is um, an example of letters added. Uh, here's another one. Here is the root that has to do with dying. Apathon. Apathon. <clears throat> you ever heard of thanatophobia? Thanatophobia is death and then the fear of it. So the fear of death. Thanatos was a Greek god, the god of death. And if you are a Marvel Avengers fan, Thanos is sort of a play on that. What is Thanos, the arch villain in the latest Avengers movie, known for? Well, killing half the, the human population. So he brings death wherever he goes. So Apathon, to die. What is the present active indicative of Apathon? It's Apothnesco. Apothnesco. There is a little Ida subscript there. <clears throat> okay. So, can you see how Apothnesco is related to Apathon? How has it been modified? Well, there are some additional letters in here, aren't there? Oops. There we go. So, what do we have? One thing that, uh, that we have is we have this SK or Sigma Kappa thrown in, right? Now, let me tell you what the future active indicative of Apothnesco is. It's Apothanumai. And what I want you to see here is simply that the future is uh, of the the future's stem is apathon. Guess what? It's more regular than the present stem is, isn't it? Because it actually is the root without any modification. <clears throat> okay. The uh, last sort of example or kind of pattern is delta D. <laughs> Say delta D. Uh, this is ablaut, ablaut. Remember what ablaut means? 
Vowels can do what? Lengthen or they can shorten or drop. Exactly. So ablaut, if you remember from first semester Greek, I refer to this as vowel gradation. Vowels change their grades from long to short, short to long, or they can go all the way to zero or nothing. So vowel gradation. <clears throat> Where do we see vowel gradation? Well, go back to apathon. Okay, the present was apathn. What happened here? Theta and nu is supposed to have sandwiched in between it an alpha, right? But the alpha has gone completely AWOL on us. Ablaut or vowel gradation can involve a vowel going from something to nothing. Okay? And that's an example of ablaut. Okay. So, those are all situations where the present stem is simply the root with modifications. Okay? That's pattern four, which is really the third pattern we've covered. In Roman numeral point, uh, Roman numeral two, we have liquid futures, and this is what Mounts is calling pattern three, and I'm insisting it's not a pattern at all, okay? But liquid futures do have some peculiarities that we need to take stock of. So let's talk about what liquid futures are. Liquid futures are verbs where the future's tense stem ends with a liquid consonant. Okay? Liquid futures have future stems with a liquid consonant. The word liquid here is being used in a loose way. I'll explain what I mean in just a minute. What does Mounts label as liquid consonants? The letters lambda, mu, nu, and rho. Okay, so rho, lambda, mu, nu. Technically, if you were to ask a linguist uh, which of these consonants are true liquids, they would say rho and lambda are. Mu and nu are nasals, but since all four behave the same way here, they, they just kind of throw them all in as liquid consonants, okay? What's the problem with liquid consonants? We're talking about liquid futures, and so when we add a future tense formative to any future stem, what tense formative is it? It's a sigma, okay? And the problem with liquid futures is that liquid consonants don't play nice with sigma. Liquid consonants do not play nice with sigma. Think about it for just a minute. You're taking a stem that ends with, say, a row, and then you're trying to add a sigma to it. How do you pronounce an R sound in your mouth? R, R. Try to pronounce a S sound right after the R. You see, with an R, you're trying to get the air to escape the side of the tongue. R, R. But with an S, you're trying to get the air to come straight over the tongue. Okay? This creates some problems with the mouth. Think about an L. Same thing. L. You're putting the tongue up onto the roof of the mouth and causing the air to come out of the side. L. But then when you go to the S sound, you need the opening where the, the tongue is hitting the top of the, the, the roof of the mouth, right? L. Less. And that's difficult. What about mu and nu? How do you pronounce a mu? Both lips come together. 
How do you pronounce an S? You got to have an opening for that air to escape. Mm -hmm. So you can't really produce the, the two of them at the same time. And then an N, a new, is nasal. So where's the air going in your nasal consonants? It's coming out of the nose. But where does the air have to come if it's producing an S? It's got to come out of the mouth. You can't have air blowing out of the mouth and the nose at the same time. Okay? So, so these all create problems for pronunciation. And so what is the solution? Okay? The solution is that instead of adding a sigma tense formative, the liquids add epsilon sigma. You stick a vowel in between the liquid and the sigma, and then that becomes easier to pronounce. Brilliant idea! But then that raises <laughs> one problem. Do you remember <clears throat> intervocalic sigmas? And that's what's going to happen, right? I'm going to get an epsilon before the sigma, and then I'm going to get my connecting vowels, omicron and epsilon, and then my personal endings, guess what that sigma is going to do? So, tense formative, connecting vowel, the sigma is going to fall out because it's intervocalic, and then the epsilon is going to do what with the connecting vowels? I'm going to get contraction. What will epsilon omicron produce? Ooh, epsilon, epsilon, A. Okay, so this is what I'm going to be seeing with, with the situation. Intervocalic sigma dropping out and then contraction. Contraction of what? The epsilon of the S, right? Sigma's gone. We'll put sigma down here plus omicron epsilon connecting vowel. Okay, so examples. Here, here we have forms of meno. Meno means to remain. Meno means to remain. Uh, I remain meno, we remain menomen. Okay? How would we form the future uh, we will remain? What would that look like? Let me just get rid of this because you're seeing the end product. It would be, under normal circumstances, this, this future stem would be men, add a sigma, add an omicron, and add the men for we. Mensamen. What do we have to do with the sigma, though, if this is a liquid consonant? Got to add epsilon. What will the sigma do? Drop out. What does epsilon omicron do? Contract to ooh. So what I'm left with at the end is men, ooh men, and I'm going to often see that circumflex there as a result of that contraction. So now look at the difference between menomen, which is present active indicative, and menumen, future active indicative. Can you tell the difference? Yeah. I remain, and menumen, I'm sorry, we remain, and menumen, we shall remain. <clears throat> How would I say I remain? It would be men, oh, right? But over here, it would be men, and it should have been men, so, but it's liquid, at an epsilon, sigma falls out, epsilon, omega, become what? Omega, exactly. So it's meno, and my accent's going to be there. So you see the difference between meno, with the accent on the epsilon, I remain, meno, I will remain. Okay? So, if it's a... Um, a uh, middle passive form, right? Men would be men semi. What do I do? Add the epsilon because of the liquid. Sigma falls out. Epsilon and omicron become omicron upsilon. So I get men umai. Okay, so uh, that would be the middle form. And, but compare that to menomai. Menomai. That's, this one's 
present active indicative, this one's future. So you see how when that interval calic sigma drops out, I'm going to get contraction and I'll be looking for those contractions plus that circumflex. That's going to be the thing I'm looking for to know that this is a future. When are you going to see these? With liquid consonants, okay? <clears throat> now, um, let me just real quickly walk through. Oh, here, do you see this number one here? I put the number one here to remind you, which pattern does Menno follow? This is pattern one, where we have the roots being used for the stems without any modification of the root to form the stem for both the present and the future, right? Take a look at apostel, okay? This has to do with sending. The real root is apostel. The present stem is apostel with a double lambda. The future, apostello. Now see, that's a liquid, so it should have been apostel. So, add the epsilon, sigma falls out, epsilon omega become omega with a contraction, right, and a circumflex. But I just want you to see, apostello, accents here, apostello, I will send. Which pattern does this liquid future follow? This is pattern four. The present stem is the root with modification, right? So you see how these are both liquid futures, but they're following the patterns that we already laid out. So liquid future is not a pattern. Liquid futures follow the other patterns. Here's R. I row, I take up, present, R row from RSO, uh, drop the sigma, contract, R row, I will take up. Notice that this is following pattern four as well, right? And then finally, we had Lego and Aero. Lego, present stem, Aero, future stem. Notice that's pattern what? Pattern two. Is the row a liquid future? Yes, because my, 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 my future stem is air, which ends with a row. That's a liquid consonant. So to say, I will say it's air, S, so, sigma falls out, epsilon, omega, contract, and I'm left with a row. You see where that came from, okay? So this is indeed a liquid future, but which pattern is it following? Not four, but two. Right? That is to say, completely different roots. And then, take a verb like crino. And meno, for that matter. The present is crino. The future is crino. Is this a liquid future? Absolutely. Are the stems the same? Yes, they're both crin. And they happen to both be the same as the root. Which pattern is that? That's pattern number one. So what you can see is that all the, the liquid futures actually could follow any of the three other patterns. So there really isn't a pattern three called liquid futures, is there? Liquid futures just follow the other three patterns. Okay. All right. So I'm going to write my own textbook and sell millions. All right, so that's Dr. Marshall's insane presentation on chapter 20. I love 20. I hate 20. I'm a conflicted man. All right, good.